Learning is a core tenet of reconciliation. So to that end, with us now to find out more about how Indigenous communities are governed, we welcome, in Tyendinaga Mohawk Territory near Belleville, Ontario, Chief Donald Miracle of the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinte. Just south of Peterborough, near Rice Lake, Chief Lori Carr of Hiawatha First Nation, which is part of Treaty 20 and Williams Treaty's lands. And just on the south side of Rice Lake, Chief Dave Mowat of Alderville First Nation, home of the Mississauga Anishinaabeg. And here in our studio, Chief R. Stacy Laforme of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And we are delighted to have all four of you chiefs with us today on this National Indigenous Peoples Day. I thought what we'd do off the top is just get to know all of you a little bit better and find out, for example, Chief Carr, why don't you start us off here? Where specifically is Hiawatha First Nation? Ane Steve, miigwech for having me. Hiawatha First Nation is located on the North Shore of Rice Lake, approximately 30 kilometers southeast of Peterborough. And we have a citizenship of 980 people. And our community makes up approximately 2,100 acres. Gotcha. And what do you see as your prime responsibility as the chief? There are many prime responsibilities, Steve. Uh, I think for us, a lot of it is housing, infrastructure, and um, citizenship, and, and coming to um, who is our community, who, who belongs to our community. It's, it's an important issue within, uh, with our citizens and with the extended family of our citizens. Understood. All right, Chief Miracle, same question. What did you tell us specifically whereabouts your First Nation is? Our First Nation is located east of Belleville, between Belleville and Kingston, Ontario, along the north shore of the Bay of Quinte. And your population is how many? We have over 10,000 members. Uh, 2,200 members live on the reserve. There's about another four or 500 non-native spouses that also live here, and some children that do not have status. Okay, and uh, I guess uh, Chief Carr said her mission was multitudinous. Maybe you could take a shot at that one as well. We are responsible for the well-being of our community members, both on and off reserve. Um, we have to look after their needs for uh, for housing, for uh, on reserve for housing, for for uh, the provision of water, for good roads, for education at all levels, for both at the public school level. This uh, the, we have uh, tuition agreements with the um, Hastings County School Board, as well as we fund post-secondary education. We provide. Um, uh, health-related services uh, uh, to the community as well as educational services. With uh, We hire uh, teachers and uh, teachers' aides and um, music instructors, uh, secretaries. We have bus drivers that look after our education program. And we have uh, nurses and other professionals that provide health care to our community. Um, we have senior, senior programming. Uh, and then we also have land claims and uh, government relations and uh, and uh, relations with uh, neighboring governments. So it is a pretty endless list, I can, I can tell. Uh, let me ask you one last thing, and that is uh, your headdress. Tell us about the significance of the headdress you're wearing. Today I'm wearing uh, a, a headdress. It's a traditional Mohawk headdress with three feathers. Uh, for the, the Mohawks had three feathers. This is the traditional chief's headdress. And I'm wearing it today because to celebrate the, uh, the Aboriginal day that's, that's commemorated in Canada. Very good. Understood. Chief Laforme, Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, you want to tell us specifically where that is? Not too far from here. Well, Mississaugas of the Credit Reserve is located, uh, I tell people, halfway between Hamilton and Port Dover. All right, but we, we have um, 3.9 million acres of treaty lands throughout the territories in southern Ontario, so it's vast. So that's why I'm always around. You're always I'm around. I'm always around. How about your population? How many people? Uh, we have um, 2,600 Mississaugas of the credit. Uh, we have roughly 10,000 in the Mississauga Nation, uh, which the Chief Carr and Chief Mowat are, are a part of. Well, we have slightly less than 10,000 than that, but, you know, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, I hear we're going to have a cold winter, so. You're the one with the sense of humor today, I can tell. <laughs> I can tell that about you already. How about your mission? What do you say is the top part? Well, you know, both the Chiefs that spoke before me listed a multitude of things, and we all deal with that. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, it's um, the main focus is uh, strategic planning in all those areas. Planning uh, for 100 and 150 years 
with the community and the nation itself and seeing where they want to go, looking at how we get there and breaking it down in manageable chunks. Gotcha. Chief Mowat, Alderville First Nation is where? Thanks, Steve. Alderville First Nation is located uh, within uh, uh, Northumberland County and uh, actually uh, Alderville Holliman uh, Township, uh, about 16 miles north of Cobert. And uh, on the south side of Rice Lake, our people originally were situated at the Bay of Quiddy, and uh, our, our community was uh, relocated to Alderville in 1835. And, and um, so we've been here for quite a long time. And um, originally a 2000 acre block of land and over uh, the ensuing 80 years, we added uh, additional lands that helped us get back on the water uh, at Rice Lake. And how many people are you? We are uh, closing in on 1,400 people on and off reserve. And again, we've had an exhaustive list of responsibilities that you all have. What would you like to add that uh, belongs on your list? Well, uh, education is a high priority. It always has been, actually. And we fund on and off reserve um, students. Um, Post-secondary education is a huge priority for us. We're able to, through our own internal resources, able to fund all of our post-secondary applicants. And so that is a huge benefit. Um, roads, infrastructure, um, bylaw making and lawmaking is a huge priority and a frustration for us uh, internally here as we have uh, been dealing with over the last two and a half years. Um, as tele telecommunications, you name it, there's a lot happening here. Um, we are on a, a very busy highway, Highway 45 that runs from Coburg up through to uh, Highway Number 7. And so there are a lot of people traveling through here and uh, economic development is also a main driver in the community. Gotcha. And one last one for you. And I'm really not trying to be a smart aleck when I ask this question, Chief Mowat, but I notice your headdress looks a little different from Chief Miracles. What's the story there? Uh, this is my blues hat, actually. Uh, I'm a musician, uh, so that's my blues hat today. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, that makes perfect sense to me. All right, thanks for that background, everybody. And now let's start to get into this. Uh, Chief Miracle, let's start with you. Um, we have heard through the course of those opening moments that you all have responsibilities for a lot of different aspects of life in your particular First Nation. And I guess I want to start, Chief Miracle, with what you see as the number one challenge facing your community today. What do you think it is? The number one challenge, I think, is to, uh, to create affordable housing for a large population, along with the basic infrastructure of good roads and, and uh, safe drinking water, uh, and also to create uh, economic development for prosperity in our community. Okay, that's interesting. So I said one major challenge, and, and you, you listed five. So it's really, it's difficult to say it's one thing because it's everything. Is that right? Well, you, you need all these things. You need safe drinking water to have good housing. So the two are intertwined. And I guess the shortfall in funding is so significant right across Canada and primarily in the Ontario region. Uh, you know, the Ontario region still has 23 First Nations communities that are on oil water advisories of the 34. Um, Ontario historically has not received its fair share of the funding to address that. And so there's a very large backlog, both in housing and uh, the need for uh, safe drinking water in the, in the Ontario region of, of Indigenous Services Canada. Uh, the Ontario region has about 25% of the, the 900,000 uh, First Nation citizens. Uh, they have about 25% on reserve and off reserve. And so we don't see the corresponding investment in the Ontario region. And uh, that, that's uh, the formula for distribution within the I ISC should be reformed to reflect the population. Hmm. I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, for that four shot back that you just had up, Sheldon, because I want to ask everybody at the same time whether or not, thank you, there it is. Could I see a show of hands here as to who has potable water on their First Nation reserve? Who has potable water? We have some, but not everybody does. Some, but not everybody. Stacy LaForme says he does. So, okay, Chief Carr, you don't have potable water on your reserve? We do not. We are working on this right now. And what we will have when the project is complete is same as Tyendinig and not all of our citizens, not all of their homes will be uh, hooked up to potable water. 
So what are you doing right now for people, I mean, for their, for their basic water needs? How are you handling it? Uh, right now, most people will buy bottled water for their home. And in our um, part of what's coming in is the, we're doing a water project. So we do have a line that will come down Hiawatha line. However, it will miss houses along uh, the other roads that we have in the community. So I believe about 40 homes will be online and then um, the rest will, they still purchase, many still purchase safe drinking water or they may have put in their own systems into their home. And what about uh, just sort of daily bathing and washing, that kind of thing, how does that work? Well, they they would most likely use their, their water for that. It's more about the drinking of that water. You'd be unable to drink it. Okay, so the water is good enough to bathe in, but not good enough to drink. Is that right? Correct. Got it. Okay, uh, Chief Moat, how about to you? You didn't put your hand up. You don't have potable water where you are. Uh, we have uh, we have some houses, very minimal number of houses that are on a point of entry system, in, in which uh, they are able to drink that. That uses a UV system, uh, but there, like I say, it's a minimal number uh, on the reserve. All of us are on wells. Some wells are better than others. And a lot of people uh, drink uh, bottled water. Um, we are working on a communal well that will allow us to have potable water in the event of an emergency. Uh, but this is a little ways off yet. So it's sort of a hodgepodge here. Uh, again, uh, Alderville First Nation is quite dissected. We have the West Reserve, we have the East Reserve, we have the Main Reserve, we have Vimy Ridge, the, the small community at Vimy Ridge. We'll never see communal water here in the same way that you might in a small town. And so our, chan our, our challenges are, are quite, uh, um, uh, you know, quite uh, all over the map, if you will. I, I know you must have asked yourself this question a thousand times, but let me make it a thousand and one. How is it possible in Canada in 2022, you still don't have access, everybody still doesn't have access to drinkable water? Well, uh, I look to the uh, to the government, to the federal government. Uh, there's other files that are coming to roost now, in which our people have been uh, on the lesser end of uh, uh, of uh, funding. For instance, um, uh, there's been uh, child welfare, for instance, um, water, drinking water. There's a number of areas and a number of files in which uh, First Nations people have had to strive to get to an equal level that other Canadians benefit from. Chief Laforme, how is it that you do have it? Uh, we've only had it for a couple of years, and, it, and it's it takes a lot of hard work and negotiation to, you know, get the funding to put put those water lines in because they're not cheap. Um, and we get, we get our waters now from the lake, uh, and when we hook the, the completion of our reserve, in the boundary roads where we touch on the Six Nations Reserve. Mm -hmm. And so we offered, you know, if they wanted to hook into the water lines as well, they, they could and most did. And um, we're hoping that, that that can become something that goes right across their territory as well, if, if they're so inclined. And you say you get the water from the lake. You mean Lake Ontario? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, for, yeah it comes through Haldeman, agreement with Haldeman, sorry. Okay. And, and uh, again, t you, you've had it for two years. How is yeah. it possible you only have had drinkable water for two years? I think the um, the um, fact that um, the government of Canada has allowed itself to um, look the other way in a lot of issues, um, dealing with the things that are on their table now and the Indigenous issues have been left at the back burner for so long that now that they're starting to look at those and address those, it's like, well, we got to do that, but we still got to do this. You know, I'm not making excuses for them, but I feel like uh, it's something that's been left on the back burner so long and now they're trying to work on it and they're realizing that there is so much to do. Do you have people, though, when the water treatment facility breaks down, know how to fix it? Uh, ours is solely supplied through water lines from Haldeman, so we don't have actually have people that work there, so we're depending on them to understand the, the process. Got it. And, yeah. when, and when they have problems, how high a priority are you to get those problems fixed? Oh, I'll, believe me, I'll be a priority. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. Okay, okay. very good. <laughs> Um, okay, I mean, water is something that's been an irritant uh, for First Nations in this country for just ages and ages. But um, Chief Miracle, maybe you could help us with this. Is there something right now that you're really proud of that's working? What's a social service or what's a, a public service 
that either you and or the government of Canada together are providing, and it's actually working? Well, the, the AFN uh, Chiefs Committee on Housing and Infrastructure have uh, have you know been lobbying uh, the government for increased investments in in um, in housing and infrastructure. There have been some uh, increases in the investment. Uh, the three million three billion dollar investment uh, in housing that was part of Budget 2022 is certainly welcome, but it, it is very seriously short uh, to meet the the overall need of 40 billion dollars. That's required nationally uh, to uh, address the housing issues. Uh, 4.4 billion is needed for the Ontario region alone, just to catch up on the backlog of need in in the region. Um, there's also a forecast of 16 billion dollars up to the year 2040. Um, the federal government plans to uh, table by by February of next year uh, a report, an, an investment plan. To address housing and infrastructure and so consultation is going on now with the first nations um by june 30th uh they have engagement sessions with the uh infrastructure people in the communities uh to give some kind of eight-year forecast on what the needs of housing and infrastructure will be chief miracle we're definitely getting the picture here that's a long list for sure I would like to get into move our conversation along to have some discussion about elected versus hereditary chiefs and Chief Carr, I'll get you in here first on this, because I gather you are from yourself a long line of chiefs in your family and community, but you yourself are elected. And I wonder how your community sort of judges the difference between those who are elected and those who inherit the job. Help us understand that. We've been in the elected process since the Indian Act, since the agent came to our community. So prior to that, it was all hereditary chiefs and it was the Potash family, which is my mother's side of the family. So my great great and my great grandfather and, um, were the elected or sorry, the hereditary chiefs. And then once the, uh, the um, Indian Act process started, then we had several of the Cowie family who were chiefs, including my dad, who had, was our elected chief for 18 years. And the community is right at this point, they are used to the elected process. That's the process that we use. But on the other hand, we're also learning, relearning, I should say, uh, the Mississauga Nation. And we're relearning who we are and how we governed traditionally. And that's a process too that will also take time. But at this moment, the elected process is the one our community knows and the one that we use. And you have been using, as you suggested, for uh, more than a hundred years. Uh, chief yes. Laform, how about you? How did you become chief? Um, two of us ran for the spot, and they disliked me a little less <laughs> than they disliked the other guy. So you got elected, okay. Yes. How does your community see the difference between hereditary and elected? So so from my, uh, my my First Nation, we've had the elected system in place, or a form of it, before the Indian Act actually came to be in place. Um, as you know, this being this far south and dealing with, you know, major, uh, major... Um, Canadians, well, I'll say Canadians, but you know, it could be British loyalists that aren't Canadians. Um, we were immersed in that culture and that sort of thing, and we took on uh, an elective process on our own under our leadership, and it's been the same since. Certainly, we're we're striving now to reclaim some of those traditions that we had in the past as the Mississauga Nation and come together and you know look at how we should be doing things and respecting our past, hmm. keeping in mind where we are today. Now, I remember when Kathleen Wynne was the premier and she used to say, we're gathered here today on the traditional territories, the Mississaugas of the new credit. And I introduced you as the Mississaugas of just the credit. Yeah. What happened to the new? <laughs> we got old. <laughs> now, the, the, we, uh, we were when we were located near the, near the water, we were called, the, and there's a long story behind it, Stephen, I don't have, we don't have time. But we became known as the Good Credit Indians, and the, and the water became known as the Credit River. When we left there and went to this new location, forced to, um, somebody thought, well, we're a new spot. We should be the new credit. So that's how it came. And then the elders go, this is no way to keep your name. Take that off of there. So we said, you're right, and we took it off. So the new is gone. The new is gone. Gotcha. All right. Uh, Chief Mowat, I want to find out a bit about your background. And to that end, I want to ask you about your great-grandfather, who I have heard was a marathoner. Is that right? That's right. 
and uh, he participated in some Olympics a long time ago? Yeah, his name was Fred Simpson. He was born in 1878 here in Alderville First Nation. Uh, he was a farm laborer. He uh, married his beautiful wife, Susan Muskrat, from Hiawatha, where he lived. Uh, he moved over there around 1899, and him and Susan raised their, uh, their children over there. But in 1906, just out of the blue, he was urged by some friends to enter into the Peterborough Examiner Road Race. And so he did, and he, uh, he finished third in that race, but he was, uh, you know, the standout visible minority, of course, at that time. And he was taken under his uh, wing, uh, under the wing of uh, Dick Baker, the trainer of the YMCA Harriers Club. And, uh, and so within a year and a half, Dick had taken him to the Hamilton Herald Road Race in 1907, in which he placed second. And the Hamilton Herald and the Boston Marathon were the two prominent long distance races on the continent at that time. And so this kind of put him in the limelight. And so between October 1907 and, and June of 1908, he had progressed to the point where he placed fourth in both the provincial and national trial in Toronto, and he won a berth on the 1908 uh, Canadian Olympic marathon team. He traveled over to England, and him and Tom Longboat were, both were the two Canadian Indigenous runners, and my great-grandfather placed sixth for Canada. Uh, unfortunately, Tom collapsed at 19 miles. And so it was my great grandfather that became my hero. And, uh, and he was his legacy is what I grew up with. And I became his biographer. And I still I still look, uh, you know, to him as a, as an icon and, and a very important pioneer in early Canadian amateur sport. Did he live long enough for you to know him? Unfortunately, no, my mother knew him well, she grew up with him, but he died, he died in 1945. Ah. Tell us about your thoughts on this uh, inherited versus uh, elected position of power. Well, our, uh, our community uh, has been, uh, they've taken in the uh, electoral system of the Indian Act since the, uh, after post 1876, after the first Indian Act came down and our people have been using that system uh, since that time. And, and so it, it is a flawed, very flawed electoral system. Uh, but uh, as far as hereditary goes, there's real no evidence that I've ever seen that there was a strong hereditary system here amongst our people. Um, there were chiefs that were voted in because of their knowledge or their prowess. John Sunday was uh, a long-standing chief of the community, but he was also a, an ordained Methodist minister. So. Because of the time, he fit the perfect, he fit the colonial bill, if you will. He was a, a, a strong spokesman and he believed in um, Methodism. He was a converted Methodist. Um, but there is no real evidence that the hereditary chief process ever took root here, not in Alderville. Uh, and my thoughts about it are that we are now pursuing other means uh, through either the uh, um, the uh, First Nations Election Act and or a custom code. And that is one of the other ways that we will get out from the current Indian Act two-year mandate that we're under right now. We've got just a couple of minutes left here. And uh, I guess, Chief Laform, I want to ask you about something that is in the news a lot right now and ask you whether or not, I guess, we can talk about it, which is, you know, the... Um, the first female head of the Assembly of First Nations is in some difficulty these days. She having been suspended by the organization, uh, she would say she's trying to root out corruption uh, that she has encountered on the job. They say she has not respected an internal investigation that is going on into all of that. And so we have a problem. Um, where do you see all this? Yeah, I, I don't want to get too involved in that because uh, I don't have all the facts as yet, right? And it's hard to form a position when you don't have all the information before you. I will say, though, that when you're dealing with people who always, both sides think they're right, the truth is always somewhere in the middle. So that's all I've got to say on that one. Okay. Yeah. Chief Carr, maybe, I mean, you're a female leader. Ruth Ann Archibald, uh, Roseanne Archibald, excuse me, is a, um, a female leader as well. I wonder, um, you know, do you have any views on this you'd care to share? My views would be uh, similar to uh, Chief LaForme, and that is 
we don't have enough facts from, we've heard two sides of the story and we don't have enough facts to have a fulsome uh, opinion on it, or we need that discussion. We need to have that discussion because the AFN is an advocacy body for the First Nations across Canada. And when there's internal conflict, I think it's important to gather all the information and then make an informed decision. Well, that's what I'm wondering about, Chief Miracle. Are you concerned that the attendant publicity around all of this is going to adversely affect either your standing in the eyes of Canadians or cause difficulty for you in negotiating with the federal government on the myriad issues you have to deal with? Well, I don't think so, because the, the, the usually the chief and councils are, are um, negotiating directly with the government about the needs of their communities. But on policy questions, the uh, the it's very, very important that the, uh, the AFN have the confidence of the people they represent, and also the confidence of the government that they're seeking funding for, for funding from, and for policy change or legislative change, and so I think it's very important to have unity and cooperation and uh, good relations among the, the regional chiefs. Um, I'm not going to comment at all on the, uh, the, the, the 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 current issue with the national chief. I, I like the others do not feel we have enough information. And it's my understanding that the regional chief, Glenn Hare, will be calling a, a meeting of the chiefs this Friday. And so we need to wait to hear what's said. There is a management committee at the AFN, which I understand that the Ontario regional chief is part of, uh, that makes these decisions. And so we need more information about the, uh, the whole affair before we do. And it really isn't our place to comment on it. It's up to the, uh, to the executive of the AFN. Understood. I want to thank all four of you for spending so much time with us here on TVO's um, agenda for this National Indigenous Peoples Day. I hope it has been a good one for all four of you, and we thank you for your time. Thank you. Miigwech. 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 The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.